morning what I want to do, um, well, let's, let me start here. A, f- a few weeks ago, we decided we wanted to put an egress window into our house because COVID equals home improvement, right? And so because I'm too cheap to, to go to A1 and rent a tractor, some mechanical device that would dig that hole, I reached, we offered to the boys, hey, anybody want to dig a hole? And knowing that we, were, we always are willing to pay for that type of work, and one of them, you know, some of them wanted some skis at this point in time, and so one of our boys said, yeah, I'll dig the hole. So with like a wooden-handled shovel like you would buy at Home Depot, and not the fiberglass ones because those are expensive, uh, one of our boys went to work, and he ended up digging this hole that's <laughs> it's five feet wide, or it's not anymore, now it's filled back in because somebody else filled it yesterday after the window was put in, but it's five feet wide, almost four feet off the foundation, and seven and a half feet deep. So it's quite an undertaking. And, but along the way, about halfway or so, he started to run into these things, which I'm no archaeologist, but I don't think this is a natural formation. It's obviously a brick. And this, for us, confirmed... Uh, what we've been told for, for some time now is that, I think it was, we were told this when we bought the house, I can't remember, but we live on Warren, and next to us is this massive mansion house that's now five apartments, but at one time it was a single-family dwelling. It's called the Warren House, that's why our street's called Warren, that's what we've been told. But what we've always been told was that next to it, which was where our house sits, used to be the carriage house, uh, but when the earthquake happened in the 30s, what year, I don't remember, what year was that thing? 36th? 36, 30, yeah, here all, it's 36, 35. Anyway, when the earthquake hit, I don't know what happened to the horses, but apparently the carriage house didn't fare very well. And so at that point, they just kind of pushed the structure over, apparently, and sold it off as a house lot. And apparently, this kind of proves it, I guess. But here, for me, it was a picture of where I wanted to go this week, uh, because next week we're going to start this brand new series from Isaiah. It's going to be our Christmas series. I'm actually super excited for it. I, I think that the great news is that Jesus also chooses favorite parts of the Bible, and I think when you spend some time in Isaiah 40 to 55, you really gain an insight into the way Jesus uh, really chose to understand God and relate to God, which I think can help us. That's what we're going to start in next week, but this week I just wanted to do this one-off where we try to slow down and ask some questions around this idea of what, what's the wisdom that's rising to the surface for you in this season? Like, As you're digging through this, where's the wisdom? Where's the insight? And not for a second do I want to trivialize the reality of the suffering in all of this. I recognize that some of you, whether it's as business owners or in your relationships, maybe even your health, that like what we're dealing with is real. I get that. But it's also Thanksgiving week and maybe also an opportunity to remind ourselves that Thanksgiving is not a holiday born of everything going so well, It's this intentional moment in the life of a people where despite what was going on around them, they found the space to do the hard work of gratitude by just asking the question, what do we have to be grateful for? And so as we head towards Thanksgiving this week, I thought maybe we just take a week and we just ask this question of what's the good here? What's the wisdom? What's rising to the surface in all of this? You know, in the world of sports, I think another way to to look at this, in the world of sports, we'll often say there's more to be won from a loss uh, than there is a victory. I think even Anna's story captures that really well, that oftentimes the moments that we look back on that are the most dynamic in our life are when things go the worst. Uh, I was the quarterback of our middle school football team. We went 0-13-1. There was a lot to learn. And the first thing I learned was, I don't think I'll play football my freshman year, which I didn't. But seriously, like that, in some way, you could say that what we're dealing with is loss. Lots of things not going our way. What's the opportunity to slow down and go, okay, uh, so, so what's to be learned? What's to be gained? What do we carry with us? What makes us better? What's the wisdom? What's the insight? And you know, so much of the season for me has been about gaining clarity around just vocation and what value do I bring and this place bring and what value doesn't it? And I got to be honest with you, my goal here this morning is, is to leave you with the question uh, it's not lost on me that, that there's a plethora of great podcasts and resources and books. Like We are all pummeled with facts and truths and ideas. I think our goal more than anything is to be a place that provokes thought, so I don't actually have necessarily the answer. That's, that's not my intention, is to ask all those questions to set up like, now here's what I'm going to tell you the answer. Frankly, my goal is that I pr- uh, provoke conversation. Uh, Whether that's around the Thanksgiving table or on the drive to Thanksgiving or whether that's because you're going to have way smaller, a a smaller group than normal and so you're not sure what you're going to talk about or if you're going to have a larger group and you're not sure what you're going to talk about. I just, I want to beg you to do the work of of assessing what's, what's the stuff that's coming to the surface. And for me, 
Part of where that takes me back to is this book in the Hebrew Bible called the book of Proverbs. Many of you will be familiar with it. If you're not familiar with the Bible, that's great. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, the, the, the book of Proverbs is in the Hebrew Bible, and it represents a tradition that wasn't just a Jewish tradition, but an entire ancient Near Eastern tradition, which was this idea of capturing sage wisdom uh, for, for later generations. And where Proverbs can get tricky is if you treat, treat every proverb like a promise or a formula or a guarantee, then like any proverb, it'll let you down. It, it's, it's not a promise. It's a principle. It's a, it's a guidepost. It's, it's this idea that, generally speaking, you'll be all the better because of this. But what stuck out to me about Proverbs is, I mean, first of all, it's, it's, it's not unique to the Jewish tradition, but also just listen to the way it begins. Proverbs, starting in the very first verse, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Now, I'm not going to claim to know the exact point where, when this version of Proverbs was finally put together for us. Probably something after the, five, after, after the exile, somewhere in the five or 400s BC. Obviously, there would have been versions before that. But what stands out here is we place David somewhere in the 900s. Solomon, obviously, shortly thereafter. So notice that there's, there's a value of a culture that wants to know what those before them had to say. There's this, there's this value of, of, of just generally believing that we don't have it within ourselves to, to assemble and pursue the most wise life that we need outside resources. And it keeps going. For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity. I think it was Billy, or Billy Graham who I first heard say that when you're stuck and don't know what to read from the Bible, just take whatever date it is and read that chapter of Proverbs. And so it was, it was sometime in the last month, maybe, I can't remember if it was November or it was October where I was in that place. And so I opened up to Proverbs and I started in chapter one. And then what stood out to me was this, just this basic observation, like notice the core assumptions of anybody who would put this book together or read it. There's this general sense that life is bigger than me, that, that what I need, I need, is, what, what, I, what I need, I need from others. There's this whole posture of pursuing wisdom. And then you ask the question, for who? Listen to this. To teach shrewdness to the simple. Like, I think we all know that when we lose, that's a chance to learn. When we get caught, you know, when we do something dumb. I have a friend who, when we do something sinful, when, when, when we get called on our stuff, I, I have a friend who used to say, we, we, we did high school stuff together, I learned how to work with high school students from him, and he would always pray that when students stepped out of line, not, you know, like not in the strictest sense, but when they started screwing around with drugs or alcohol or sex or those things, he would always pray, just God, I, I pray that they get caught. And that was counterintuitive to my way of thinking because it's easy to assume that it's not wrong unless you get caught. But his point wasn't this kind of punitive thing. His point was, there's always grace. Like, we get confronted on our brokenness when we get caught. And I think that's an aspect of Proverbs, right? Like, when, when life doesn't work, we tend to be more receptive to outside wisdom. But it doesn't stop there. Knowledge and prudence to the young. So there's this other assumption that I think is probably one that we would all adopt, that when you lack experience, or when you don't necessarily... Have, have, have enough life experience to know when, when you're of a certain age, when you're new to the job. But then this one also stands out. Let the wise also hear and gain in learning, and the discerning acquire skill. I think it was the great Howard Hendricks who used to say, your experience is as, is as likely to be a liability as it is an asset. So, so notice that there, there's, a, there's a posture here that, that even their best... Even their sages, even the people with the, the best marriage, the best relationships, the one who you most admire, that there, there's this almost self-fulfilling pr prophecy where the people who, who seem the most polished are probably the ones that are most receptive to outside wisdom. Again, my question is, what's the wisdom coming to the surface for you? What, what's the opportunity and it keeps going. Look at verse 20. Wisdom cries out in the... Str oh, wait. So sorry, I skipped one, Anna. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, this is highly offensive in our culture to our modern sensibilities. It's even a little offensive to me for everything that we try to create around here, which is this approachability. So listen, if you're not an apprentice of Jesus, I get it. That's really offensive to say that the fear of God is the basis of all knowledge. 
I understand if you're a scientist, that might be especially weird to take in. And I, I think there's permission to disagree with it. But maybe start from this. What's the core assumption of the person who signs off on this? What, what does it say about their humility? What does it say about their posture towards what they know and what they don't know? What does it say about where they stand in the center of the universe or the lack thereof? And I think for those of us that are apprentices of Jesus, I know even just this week, I'm, I'm working through this book by David Brooks called The Road to Character, and it was just this reminder that, oh yeah, we can become so sophisticated in our study and just drift away from this basic idea that the fear of the Lord is where all wisdom starts from, from where it emanates. And I don't think, I think that can be held in tension with scientific discovery and things like that. But then listen to verse 20. Here we go. Sorry, Anna. Uh, wisdom cries out in the street. In the square, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. Notice the availability. I mean, that's what's going on here. She cries out in the street, in the squares, at the, at the city gate. In other words, how accessible to their sensibilities is wisdom? Is it predicated upon your IQ? Is it predicated upon your level of education? Is it predicated upon your age? Is it predicated upon your race? Notice this is a culture who, who fundamentally wanted to believe that wisdom was readily available. It was right in your face should you be open to receiving it. It continues, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge. Here's the other thing that stands out to me. To what degree is wisdom a team sport? Right? Like, what we know are, are quotes. I heard Dave Ramsey recently say uh, that, that relationships are the emergency fund for life. And I go, that's brilliant. He's brilliant. Wow, what a guru. But is, is that the result of him in his study by himself, or is that the, life of, of the result of shared life together? Notice that for them, wisdom and arriving at wisdom and moving forward and sifting through the bricks and deciding which ones are worth keeping and which ones, frankly, aren't worth keeping, what are the treasures and what are what not, notice it implies, it's, it's, it implies relationship. And you know this. My, my friend Fred, who's the most brilliant thinker of relationships I know, he keeps two reflectors on his table where he meets with people, a red one and a yellow one. And one of them says feelings, and one of them says truth. And his point is to illustrate for people, when you're closest to the problem, your ability to discern truth is, is least reliable because your feelings are involved. Notice for these people, there's this assumption that arriving at a place of wisdom, it, it, it's done together. And, and you know this, and I know this. And actually, I wonder if that's not one of the great truths of this season. I, I know it is for me, and again, I, I don't want to barrage you with, here's what I've learned. I'd love to go for a walk and exchange ideas, but I do wonder if this is one of them. Listen, I get it. Some, some of you are you're watching online or listening to the podcast, and, and, and I, I can totally honor and accept why it's not okay for you to be here. I, I get that. But I wonder if the danger of this season is a message that says faith is ultimately a one-on-one -on -one sport, and I wonder if that, that in and of itself isn't a very, very dangerous idea to adopt over the long haul. What's the value of relationship? D David Brooks, in this message he gave at BYU before COVID happened, he, he said uh, his data, and I don't know what his data, where, where he got his data, but he said, I trust him as this published columnist and national speaker. He said 35% of American adults 45 years and older identify as mostly lonely. I was talking to Fred just a couple weeks ago, and I asked him about that, and he said, Adam, my observation is he's pushing 70 my friends that decades ago decided to get rather intentional with their friendship and almost schedule it to a fault, they're doing really well right now. And my friends who allowed their friends to just be, you know, whoever their kids happen to be playing sports with, whoever, who they, whoever they tend to work with or whatever, they really struggle in that season of life. Since 2011, teen suicide has gone up 70%. I mean, that's astounding. The college depression rate has doubled in the last 10 years. 
What if part of the, the treasure of this season, part of the truth, is this our unhealthy commitment to individualism? And in an ironic fashion, what if part of what COVID's doing is begging us to consider the extent to which we're really made to do life alone? And frankly, the extent to which that, that's really what leads to happiness. What if there's something to this idea that the quality of our life will be determined by the quality of our relationships? Proverbs 22 is, is another one I think plays into this theme. It's such a good punchy proverb. Andy Stanley's written a whole book. We, we stole the series years ago in the, in the Cinemark, but listen to this. The clever see danger and hide, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Question, does one group see the problem, does one, per, one, does one group's shovel hit the brick and the other not? No, like, interesting, isn't it? That they, their argument is that for things, for people that things go very poorly for, the extent to which they control it, and for people for things that go really well, they both are dealing with the same set of facts. So what differentiates them? According to this proverb, what differentiates wisdom from, from foolishness? Clever is, is a positive term here. What, what makes someone clever? It's, it's their ability not just to identify the brick, but but to actually change course because of the brick. See, here's my challenge to you as we move towards Thanksgiving. What if we don't just drift towards Turkey, but we actually just, and I don't mean that to be condescending, that kind of sounded condescending. I mean, but what, what if there was this practice this week of going, okay, what's the good? And what's the stuff, because I think there's this general posture of like when COVID's over, it just returns to normal. And I, I don't know, I've kind of stopped trying to predict any of that stuff. I don't find it helpful when it's going to happen, what it's going to look like when it does. But, but what if you were to emerge knowing that no matter what life goes back to, I will go back to this and I won't go back to this and I'm going to carry this value and frankly, this will have changed me forever. You know, one of, one of the meetings that I have about twice a year, and, and I can generally see them coming, and they're, they're terrifying because there's nothing I can do. It, it, it happens about twice a year where I'm, I sit down with somebody, and, and the scenario is this. I'm sitting with either husband or wife, and their spouse has told them they're done, capital D. And I'm meeting with the person, and generally there's a few themes that are always true. First of all, that person's been told that many times before, and it never took root, and this time it has. And the reality is, and I know this as I'm listening to this person, I try not to know it, but generally it holds true, there's, there's nothing that can be done. Their spouse is done no matter what, and I'm sitting with the person who's hoping that I know some helpful wisdom that will cause their spouse to give them one more shot because this time they're actually going to change. I think this is Proverbs 22, isn't it? It's this warning. That, that's not them. That's us. And that's not you. That's me. That's any of us. That's not marriage. That's life. Where, where's the wisdom coming to the surface in this season? And here's the other way that I would ask it, and maybe this is I debated this week whether this is relevant or not, but I think it is because I think it's fairly safe to operate on the assumption that if you're in the room or you're listening right now, that, that on some level, either in the past or in the present, being a part of a faith community was a part of your deal. Here's the other question that I actually, th I find this invigorating. I, I, I've been wrestling with it for months, and it's this question of what's the value of local church? And when I say local church, I, I'm begging you to move beyond the kind of esoteric and ask the specific. You know, what's the value of local community theater would be another way to ask it. At this point, we know not every community gets to operate, you don't get to operate on the assumption that every Montana city has a great local theater like the Grand Street. It exists because, because people choose that that's a value and, and they make that happen. I, I think it's reasonable to say that in, in our post-Christian, post-church world, that's going to become more and more true of church. And I'm not saying that to, to create fear or even to grab control, but I actually find it invigorating to go, okay, so what is the value of local church? Why, why do I, and in this case, why do you, 
share a vision for making sure that places like that exist in your community. And again, I, I'm really not trying to strong arm you to, well, obviously it's valuable. I realize that it looks like I have a horse in the race, and I guess I do. But, but I, I, as much as any of you, probably just like you in your, own, in your own work, I have to fight for the vision for what I do all the time, maybe more than you do. It's, it's a tricky thing making your living from other people's tithes. I think it's a healthy process to constantly be working through, why do I still believe in this? Why do I still believe in this? Why do I still believe in this? I have this deep desire to know who I am when it's not my job, so why do I still believe in this? But why do you? What's the value here? And what if COVID, far from being the end of church, is an opportunity for Christ-following people to really assess and go, where, where's their meaning? And I don't mean to even therefore assume that when you get through that process, you'll find meaning in narrate or in church in general. But what if there's value there? Not, not in church necessarily, though I think there is, in doing the work of asking the question. I, here I will give you my answer just because I, I guess I, I feel like, well, I want to. Uh, I could think of four things. Uh, one is... I still think and I still value the church as a beacon for Christ in a community. Uh, you've heard my story a lot. I was the 17-year-old kid whose plans for living were proving incredibly unhelpful. I'm so grateful that there was a mega church in Billings called Faith Chapel where, where I could walk in the door and it wasn't weird. The reason we meet in a public facility, not a church building, is because I just think hopefully that helps people go like, it can't be that weird or else they wouldn't get to rent the space. When you think about cultural dissonance, which speaks to like how different are the people in there from you out there. I'm so grateful for a church that bought into eliminating all unnecessary barriers so me as a 17-year-old kid could walk in a church and not just leave before I even got to the chair because there was enough similarity. I identified with it enough to go, okay, I'll take it in and listen. And I, I guess, I think Nathan nailed it a couple weeks ago when, when they did that panel, he and Rob and Justin, when he said, listen, if over political matters... Jeff and Troy, who teach and narrate kids, if out of political differences they move on, Jeff and Troy will be fine. But, but the kids they serve will suffer. They'll miss out. I gotta be honest, I still think that's, for me, one of the more compelling visions of local church. The reality is, if, if, if we drift, if those of you that haven't been here since March, and again, I respect that, but if you drift permanently, you're probably going to be fine, especially if you've already found a small group and you're doing house church and you're doing small group and you know how to have a good quiet time. You're probably fine. But the irony is, it's highly likely that your story was like Anna's and you needed a place to walk in the back door of and just hopefully find hope. I think that the church is still the bride of Christ and, and people will tell me that things like this aren't relevant in the future, but I just... I don't see it yet, just like I think we could admire how Grand Street has fought and clawed to make sure that local community theater stays a staple. It's not everywhere, but it is here. The other one for me is, and this is the one that, for my boys, if I had one answer, why church, Dad, I would say, because when you move to a new town and you find yourself lonely and you're a 35-year-old man, I hope that when you start searching for a community, what your system tells you is that a good local church is the best place to find people to share life with. Not because they're the best people, not because they're perfect people, not because they're all even Christ-following people, but because it's a great smorgasbord of people where you can shop and you can fish and you can figure out who, who fits with you and who doesn't and who do you share things with and who doesn't and then just share your passions for life with them. I think it's a great place for that. The third one for me is this, I think it's a great place to serve people together. I, 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 like probably many of you, I've on several occasions thought, what would it look like to just have a small group and make that my church family for the rest of my life? And here's, here's what I know because of what I do. It looks easy to do what Hannah does. It looks easy to form those relationships and make those contacts and find ways to serve people together. It's not, it's a full-time job. So for me, one of those things I'm clinging to is the chance to serve people together. I actually asked Fred a few weeks ago, we just talk once a quarter now, and I asked him, I said, Fred, why do you still go to church? Because here's the context. Fred, by, by church accounts, by, by the size of his influence account, is the biggest church probably in the Pacific Northwest. 
definitely in Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas. Fred, Fred, in a given year, if probably not more like every six months, has personal contact with about 10,000 people, be my guess. Somewhere in there, we've talked about this before, I, I forget the exact number. That's a big church. Problem is, he's not a pastor. He's a retired insurance agent who, who walks with people and meets with people and does small studies with people. So if anybody in the world doesn't need this, it's him. I asked him, why do you still go? He said, Adam, I, I got a few reasons. So now I'm reasons inside of reasons here. He said, first of all, and this gets to that, a place to serve, he said, I, I still think when local church is done well, it brings more value to a local community than any other institution. And he allowed, that's potentially offensive, especially in our day, because we have some great ones. But he said, when you slow down and think what a thriving local church accomplishes for people, oftentimes free of charge, though there's this thing called tithing that people buy into. He said, it's astounding. I still think that they're the best asset a community has when it goes well. And then he said this, and this one was interesting to me, because again, Fred, Fred's as church critical as anybody. Like He and I kind of shared that together. He, he meets with lots of people who get beat up by pastors and misled by pastors, so he, he, he sees the dark underbelly. But his second reason was this. He said, Adam, my experience is that people who don't follow Jesus get confused by people who do that don't go to church. And he just went on to explain that when he's working with somebody who's considering faith, he said, my experience, and he speaks from experience because he has lots of friends who aren't a part of places like this. They would call his small group with them their church. He said, my experience is that when people are really moving towards Christ, people who aren't connected to, to, to the family are actually really confusing to them. Then he said this, and this would be my last reason, I guess. He said, and Adam, I still think there's something to the corporate worship. I think what Jesse and Anna and Teresa and Brent led us through this morning speaks for itself. And he said, and I think, still think there's something for the like weekly sermon and just the content. And then he said, he said, rarely do I hear anything I haven't heard before. But that's also kind of not the point. It's about taking something in that recenters and resets. So, I'm probably preaching to the choir. You're sitting in church during a pandemic. You're listening in a season where they they say at least a third of people who were doing church in some form before COVID have done nothing since. So I, I get that. But what's the value? What's the wisdom? As you contemplate, what's the value add for you? What if you do that work? What if, you, what if you catch yourself drifting in this season and identify there were these times where we set this as the goal and we've drifted? What if that's the opportunity of COVID, to, to recognize drift? Years ago, some friends invited us to bring our boys and visit them, their parents in Washington. They lived on the Puget Sound. Their parents are these phenomenal people who would show our boys grand adventures with sea urchins and crabs and sharks and things like that. And so we went... And one day, he, they took us out on the boat, and the boys caught sharks, not on the open ocean, but in the sound. And when we were done doing that, we kind of motored over to this little beach. And the, the conversation was like, well, let's jump out of the boat and maybe go eat lunch. And I can't remember if some of us had drove there or parked there, or what all the details were. I just remember jumping out of the boat, kind of knee-high, waist-high water, and wading up to the shore, and dropping anchor, and eating, and turning over seashells, and skipping rocks, and that kind of thing. And then maybe an hour or two later, we turned to leave, and this was just... Classic. I was just getting to know my, my friend's dad, who is this astoundingly awesome guy, but it was classic. And we turned to leave, and the boat was on the beach, like a bad postcard, just resting there, no water to be found. Uh, because while we were playing around, the, the water had drifted out, and so the boat was just so we couldn't leave if we wanted to. I think that's what COVID can reveal, is those areas where we've drifted, and the great thing about drifting is when we identify that we've drifted, we, we already had a bearing. We already knew where we were trying to get to. We just got to turn ourselves back to that. So, so what are the areas where this season is helping you catch your drift? And what if, what if you could lead the way this Thanksgiving uh, to avoid more of the like circle the toilet bowl conversation, politics and COVID and woe is me and woe is me, and instead to have done the work of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, what's the stuff in this season that's actually the wisdom that's risen to the surface? What's the stuff that is valuable? What's the stuff to pay attention to? Not necessarily easy, 
But what's the wisdom rising to the surface for you? And wouldn't it make sense that Christ would use this kind of a season to make you better? Remember his, his half-brother James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance, when it's complete, will make your faith more complete. But the irony of that passage is he goes on to rebuke them because it seems like what's going on there is people had prayed for wisdom, then some bad things happened, and the people are going, just take the bad things away. And James is rebuking them going, you guys are like waves tossed by the sea because he's going, what do you want? Do you want wisdom or do you want ideal circumstances? Because it seems that the assumption is that we're most receptive to new ideas in the midst of a loss. Doesn't mean the loss can't hurt. It just means we maybe find Christ most brilliantly in it. So I'd like to pray for you in that process and we'll sing our way out of here. God, my prayer is for my friends that uh, they, would, they would do the deep spiritual emotional work of paying attention to how you're showing up in this season. And that our thoughts towards the future and our lack of control over said future would would pale in comparison to the, the current evidence of a God who can be trusted to lead us through life. That much of what we thought we had to have to be content is not true, that much of what we thought we couldn't cope with is also not true, but that Jesus, you're the, you're the Our Father who's right here present with us. So, God, my prayer would just be that there would, there would be a leadership that happens, um, a, a cadence that we can set, a pace that we could set by leading forth in the, not, not this Pollyanna-ish, like nothing, everything's awesome, but in this more sincere, but here's the good that's emerging from it. Amen. If you would like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.